Hi, I'm Javier from Javier Restaurants, and now one of the passion is you. I thought that uh, it was amazing, everything that he asked me. Uh, he made me go all the way to my childhood, to Tijuana. He made me remember the best times from, t from Tortilla Flats. I think he should be in the restaurant business. <laughs> His uh, question was very, uh, very uh, uh, interesting, uh, and I hope people enjoy the show. Welcome to this episode of the Passionate Few podcast today. It's your host, Omar here, and today you're in for a treat because by the end of this interview, you'll be absolutely blown away as we get to sit down with restaurateur mogul and my good friend, Javier Sosa of Javier's Restaurants. In this incredible interview, Javier shares with us how he came to this country as an immigrant from Mexico from very humble beginnings to wash dishes in his early teens and would spend nearly 20 plus years learning the ins and outs of almost every single profession in the Mexican restaurant industry. And ultimately, Javier also shares with us how he ended up getting fired in his mid-40s, losing everything, including his home, and had nothing but his wife, his kids, and a mattress before reinventing himself and starting what would become the Javier's Restaurant Empire. And with six locations and hundreds of employees and growing, not only does the company generate tens of millions of dollars per location, but it's also frequented by social elites, including getting praise from the late Kobe Bryant, as well as Mr. Wynn himself of the Las Vegas casinos. And in this interview, Javier shares with us not only how he pioneered the Taco Tuesday movement and was able to make his vision a reality on his mission to create the very definition of what it means to have an upscale restaurant in business, but also how anybody listening to this can apply these principles to make their dreams and their visions a reality. So with no further ado, I want to encourage you guys to sit back, relax, and enjoy this powerful interview about a man on a mission who manifested his vision into reality, the man who's loved just as much by his employees as he is his customers, and you will too by the end of this interview, none other than the incredibly inspiring story of a Mexican immigrant turned mogul, Javier Sosa of Javier's Restaurants. Enjoy. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Javier Sosa. Gracias, Omar. Absolutely. And again, thank you so much for having us here in your beautiful restaurant. It's an honor to uh, get to share your story. So thank you again for having us. Thank you. Um, so before you became this you know, successful restaurateur and had these restaurants that people rave about, uh, like where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And sort of take me back to where you grew up as a kid. I was born and raised in Tijuana, mm -hmm. in La Colonia Independencia. Um, I uh, had my mom, my dad, and we were seven in the family. I had a very nice childhood, uh, very happy. It's very nice when you grow up, when you have a father and you have a mom and you have a family, and you grow up not having any money because you don't know the difference of having money or luxuries yeah. or going to the movies yeah. or going for a vacation. Or it's, that, those things, they, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. But you get up in the mornings, you have your breakfast, your mama makes your tortillas, handmade, yeah. so you're happy. Yeah. And the only thing you know how to do is grow up, go to school, and play sports. Yeah. So as a kid, what did you get into? Did you play soccer? Did your family have money or not really? No, we didn't have any money because we didn't need to have money. Yeah. <laughs> but we were very happy. Uh, I grew up and I, I, I was inspired by soccer. And by the girls, yeah. I did not like going to school <laughs> at all. Yeah. I thought I was going to become a professional soccer player. Um, so I played soccer since I was eight years old till I was 19, just when I came here to uh, Laguna Beach. Oh, wow. And did you have any jobs as a kid in Mexico or just soccer? That was, that was the full vision. I did work for a year in a restaurant called El Cochito. Uh, they sold carnitas, mm -hmm. so I was working there for one year. Uh, How old were you at that time? I was 12 to 13 years old. Working at 12 and 13? Yeah, it's, wow. that's when my dad died and I didn't want to go to school, so I worked one year there. Did that affect you pretty, pretty rough when your father passed? I think so, yes. You know, when you're very close to your family and, and to your dad and, and being uh, 12 years old, yes, it, it's very hard. Yeah. Did it also create a chip on your shoulder or motivation to maybe excel in soccer or anything like that or not really? You were always on your own, inspired and driven, had a vision. I, 
I didn't have a chip on my shoulders. I always wanted to be a soccer player. And I, I'm always, since I was growing up as a kid, I always had motivation for do things that I like. You just didn't know how to channel it, per se. I didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah. Uh, and but school wasn't the, the plan. No. <laughs> yeah. And then, so, talk to me about, you know, you played soccer till 19, and your goal was to be a professional. Did you ever get a chance to do that a little bit, or...? I, I didn't have the chance because uh, we were getting ready to go to our third national and I was in my prime when I was going to be turn 19. So that's when I came here to Laguna Beach. And what brought you to Laguna Beach? I needed to work. <laughs> you needed money. I needed money. My family needed money. My mom needed money and, uh, and I just needed to work. So what did you do at Tortilla Flats when you came to Laguna Beach? Well, my, I had a friend who grew up with me in Tijuana and he got a job in Laguna Beach and he was a dishwasher. So he, I remember still the night, it was a Saturday night when he got there and he said to me, Javier, you want to work? We need a dishwasher. And I told the people in Tortilla Flats that I have a friend who wants to come and work as a dishwasher. Yeah. And I said, I'm not going to, I didn't want to come. Yeah. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to go to the Nationals, yeah. and I'm not going to play. You're going to be a soccer player, not yes. a dishwasher. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I remember I went home that night, and I started thinking, and I said, you know what, I think it's better for me to go and work. Wow. So I decided to come with him yeah. and start working. Wow. That's crazy. What, what made you make that decision of, of doing it? Just It felt right in your gut? or It, it didn't feel fine in my gut. It, <laughs> I needed to work because... I needed to help my mom and my family, yeah. you know, and that, I needed to work. Period, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So then you come here, and then how long do you end up working uh, at Tortilla Flats? Was your plan to work for a couple weeks, couple months? I was, I wanted to work for about four months. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to work till December, yeah. make money, buy me a car, yeah. go back to my girlfriend <laughs> with a car, yeah, and with a little bit of money, and I'm still here. Yeah. Wow. So you ended up working there, what, I think, uh, I know you, you, I flew with you in your private jet to uh, Vegas, and we talked a little bit about your story. You said that you work, ended up working there for like 20 years, right? 23 years I worked. 23 years, wow. What kept you there so long? I met my wife. Yeah. <laughs> I got married. Yeah. Uh, she worked at the restaurant? Yes. Wow, and you guys hit it off right away or started as friends? <laughs> I want to hear the story. <laughs> well, I remember that it was a Tuesday, and I went in to start doing my dishes. I put my apron, and then I turn around and I see this beautiful girl yeah. working in the line, the cook line, and I go, so I asked my friend, what is this beautiful girl doing there? Yeah. And, she, and he said, she works here. Yeah. He said, you're kidding. <laughs> and <laughs> like, I love I, this job. I remember that he said, remember that I said it was a girl working here and it was very nice, so you stay away from her because yeah. she's a very nice girl. Uh, I'm not saying, so, yeah. so, so at some point you approached her though, right? She did. Oh, she, no way, really? <laughs> Just kidding. No, yeah. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Yes. And you guys have been together now ever since, huh? 48 years. 48 years? Yes. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, so we'll get into that, but talk to me a little bit about what you learned at Tortilla Flats, because you came for four months. You ended up staying more than two decades. Um, and I know at the time it started as a small location by the time you left, I think you said there was like three bigger locations. The restaurant had been successful. Talk to me a little bit about what you learned along your journey or what was happening for you mentally. What were you learning? What was your vision at that time? Well, you know, uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, when I started working there, you know, I, I, I started as a dishwasher and I was the cleanup man. I became a cook. I became a waiter. I became a bartender. And I knew that I wanted to be the best employee because I wanted to be the boss of everybody <laughs> in that restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, I always, and that's my personality, everything that I do, I always want to become the best in what I do. So, and then I got married. I couldn't be uh, doing dishes or yeah. doing cleanup. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. Where did your desire to have these visions, inspiration to be the best? I mean, you came from humble beginnings. 
most people usually have an example around them. What is it that made you so motivated for success or to be the best or have this vision of excellence? Where did that come from? Is that just in your DNA or did you learn it somewhere as a kid or where did that come from? I think that, I think that you're born with it. Okay, I'm not saying that you don't, people don't have it, but I think me personally, I can think that I was born with it. I, um, I remember when I was living here and we didn't have any money, but I was working. I was trying to buy cars with no money. I was trying to buy a house without having money. <laughs> so, I was, so I was trying to do something. You know, yeah. I was always thinking that I wanted to do something in life. Yeah, always. And was the vision like, oh, I want to be a millionaire eventually? Or I want to, I want to have all these things, or what was flowing through your head at that time? I, I never thought that I was going to be a millionaire. Yeah. Uh, I never thought that I was going to be so successful. Yeah. Um. When, when I was working at Tia Flats, uh, I got to know a lot of people. Uh, you know, it, 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 after, after years when I became a manager there, it didn't feel like I was at work. It felt like I was <laughs> at just in something that I like to do. Yeah, just hanging it, out with friends. Well, you really don't hang around with friends because you work doubles every day, you open and close. Yeah. It was hard. Yeah. It's, it was not e easy, you know. So whoever wants to be successful and become successful, you know what? Number one, you have to be, have a vision and you have to be serious. You know that you have to work hard and you know you have to sacrifice yourself. Nothing comes because you're very lucky. I'm a little lucky, yeah. I admitted it, <laughs> but you have to work hard. Wow, and then talk to me a little bit about Tortilla Flats. I know that you are part of the team that coined the first Taco Tuesday. Talk to me a little bit about how that came about, because that was what, in the 80s? Yes, when um, we, we started with a small Tortilla Flats, it was a very small restaurant, and then we became bigger we made it bigger it was a beautiful restaurant mm -hmm. then we opened a beautiful bar upstairs and um tuesdays was the slowest night of the week okay i remember las brisas had opened a few months ago and they were pretty busy so we decided to put tacos for 50 cents in the bar wow so you invented taco tuesday I can take the credit that I named it Taco Tuesday, yeah. the customer named it Taco Tuesday. <laughs> we put tacos in the bar for 50 cents. Wow. The way it got named Taco Tuesday is because people start calling when we start getting busier. Yeah. Hey guys, do you have Taco Tuesday? I heard that you have Taco Tuesday, it's Taco for 50 cents. And we yeah. said, yeah. So that became uh, the busiest and the craziest day. I think that everybody was in Laguna Beach in those days on Taco Tuesday. That's a good lesson in marketing. You ended up taking the slowest day of the week and ended up making it the busiest day of the week. That was pure luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you have to take chances to get lucky, and you guys took them. That's awesome. So then talk to me about what else you learned. I mean, you took on many roles in the restaurant business. You said you started working at your first restaurant at 13. You come here at 19, give up your soccer dreams to wash dishes, uh, to make money. And then you said 23 years you ended up working there. Uh, after doing all these roles, what is it that you learned or what is it that developed in you? Or was it just, you were just building the muscle of excellence? Were you learning the business too? Or did you, did you have the vision of maybe doing something on your own? What was going through your mind during that time? Uh, I didn't, in those days, I didn't think that I was gonna have a place in my own. I was focused in the restaurant and I wanted to become the best restaurant when I was working there. I was afraid to be in my, to go on my own and I didn't have the money anyway to go on my own. So, all my focus was at Tortilla Flats. And after 23 years, what happens working there? Uh, they fire me. Wow. And you don't have to get too into it, but what did they fire you for? Because they accused me of stealing and selling drugs and many things. Wow. So after two decades of service, you get fired? Yes. Are you pissed or are you calm? I mean, you seem like a pretty mellow guy, but I'm sure you were pissed as hell at that time. Uh, you know, I was not pissed. How can I say it? I was really disappointed and I was really worried. <laughs> That's what I was. <laughs> yeah. That I was going to a house that we just bought and I haven't made my first payment. So you just bought a house right before you got fired? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and they you knew, did they know you just bought a house? Yes. As a matter of fact, they loaned me money to put them as a down payment. <laughs> oh my God. Holy shit. So then what's going through your mind the day you get fired? 
Uh, what's next? What am I going to do? You know, I'm going to lose my house. Yeah. I have to start working. I got my kids in school. Uh, and how old were you at the time you got fired? 45. So 45 years old, fired. Holy shit. One of the things that I, I, I always was thinking is, I have, do I have to start all over again? I have to start working all over again. I said, I don't want to work doubles anymore. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to open. I don't want to close restaurants to become successful. And I was upset because I missed a lot of the games when my kids were in school because at work. Yeah. We miss a lot of Christmas days. We miss a lot of holidays with the family because of work. That, was, that made me upset more than anything. Wow. How did you tell your wife? Or did she work there at that she time? She worked too? with me. We got fired together. No way. So both of you got fired. So that cut your income completely. Yeah. Um, we got fired about five of the people that worked with me. Yeah. And then they fired about 60 more employees. Anybody who was close to me got fired. Or anybody who they knew they talked to me got fired. Wow. Holy cow. So then what do you do? You go back to the drawing board? I mean, did you guys end up losing the house or what happened? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we uh, lost, lost the house. And uh, in the beginning, you know, when I was fired, I didn't want to get out of my house because yeah. you get into depression. Yeah, you get into a negative state. And, and, yeah. um, and it's something, you know, that is for experience that I want everybody to understand. If you get fired, most of the time, that what you're really doing is thinking about yourself and feeling sorry about yourself. Yeah. If I had another chance, that would not happen. But I mean, I was upset. Uh, I was embarrassed to go out in the street because of the stealing thing. Yeah, the um, reputation, you knew a lot of people in the area. Yeah. Yes. So, um, but it took me about six months for me to get out of it. It's like one day you feel like you wake up and you said, what, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Start, stop feeling sorry for yourself and go to work. And are you completely broke at this time? Yes. Completely yes. broke? Yeah, I, I was completely broke. And for go to the movies, I'm not kidding you, me and my wife. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't afford to buy popcorn. <laughs> you couldn't afford to buy popcorn? Not, I'm not making it up. Holy it's shit. True. In your mid 40s? Yes. Holy shit. Yes. So, what do you, you and your wife do? You guys start planning ideas? Uh, what's, what's going on at that I, time? Actually, I was looking for a job and I, it was difficult for me to get a job. But, but this time, I have, I have already talked to Mark Post, my partner. Mm -hmm. He was a waiter uh, with me. Mm -hmm. And he worked for me for about three or four years. And he came to me a few times and he wanted me to open a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Since he stopped working with us, he said, Javier, one day we're going to open a restaurant. I said, <laughs> Well, you never know, Mark. Yeah. But he looked for me a couple of times to open a restaurant, but I wasn't ready. Yeah. I was afraid to go on my own. Yeah. But when I was fired, I had a meeting with him. Yeah. And he said, well, let's start looking for a place. Yeah. And um, I wanted to be in Laguna. I didn't want to be any place else. I yeah. wanted to be in Laguna Beach. I'm the same. I love Laguna Beach, yeah. But I wanted to be in Laguna not so much because I love Laguna Beach, because I do and I love the people from Laguna Beach. Yeah. But I needed to show the other people ah, that I knew what I was doing. You wanted to prove a point to Tortilla Flats after firing you. It's bad to say it, yeah. but yes. Yeah. So that, that was your motivation too at that time? Yes. Wow. Well, I had a lot of motivation. You know, I had the motivation of my family. Yeah. I had a lot of friends like Eloy who worked for me. And when he came to work at Tortilla Flats with me, he worked at the Surf and Sand for years. Yeah. And he started working with me and he got fired and he yeah. was a lot older than me. Yeah. And I, I needed to open a restaurant. In Laguna? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I love it. So, okay, so talk to me really quick. So when you get fired, your wife stood by you during that time when you had nothing? My wife is the best. She's a classy, yeah. she's a classy lady. Wow. I mean, Money and no money, we're going to be together. That doesn't need to do with No matter that. what. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now, can you talk to the people out there who might be listening and hearing this or watching this, who might be going, holy shit, you know, you built this massively successful company uh, doing tens of millions of dollars in revenue and thousands of happy customers. But uh, at the time, you're in your mid-40s. Most people at that age, if things weren't working, would go, shit, maybe I'm not cut out for this entrepreneurship thing. Or, you know, they get stuck, like you were saying, in depression. 
But talk to me about what was your mindset at the time and what advice would you give to people watching this who might be in that time now where they just got fired or they're you know, failing or broke or tr have a dream or vision but are stuck. What, what advice would you give to somebody in that situation right now trying to make their dreams happen? Well, like I said, you have to have the personality. That's number one. And you have to be serious about it. In anything that you want to do in life, you know you have to work because success has a price. And you have to be focused. Uh, I personally, I could talk about myself. I knew that I wanted to open that restaurant and I knew if I had the chance to open the other restaurant, we were gonna become the busiest restaurant. I had it in my mind. Yeah. Um, it was just something that I felt. And, um, Did you always have the vision of it and would always see it in your mind, imagine customers? I mean, not at this level. Yeah. You know, uh, when we opened the first half years in 1995, um, I, we did have a meeting, I remember. Yeah. And I said, I want to make sure that you guys understand that we're not going to become the best Mexican restaurant. We're going to become the best restaurant, period. Yeah. And we are going to be the best restaurant. So, uh, and everybody who's been with us, because I, so many people that have been with us, yeah. and part of the success that we have, uh, they, uh, they just work very hard. Yeah, which is amazing. And now you have employees, and we'll get into it, but now you have employees who've been here, what, 10, 20 years plus, right? Uh, that's a little short. Yeah. That's, a, that's a new one. We have employees that have been with us for 30 years. Wow. 35 years. Yeah. We have uh, somebody who just passed away about five years ago. He was with us in the 70s. Yeah. The main lady who was Josefina, who the lady who made us who, who, what we are yeah. when it comes to food. Yeah. She died about three years ago. Wow. Uh, so everybody who, we've been together for a long time. It's, yeah. it's not like, like employees, it's more, it's not, we have over 800 employees. 800 employees. Yes. Holy cow. So you have a lot on your plate. <laughs> yes, but you know, I got kids that, that really help me and I have a lot of great people working with us. Mm -hmm, that run it. Now talk to me about what you learned at Tortilla Flats or at any point that allows you to maintain employees. I mean, I know some of your employees, Araceli uh, a great friend who helped coordinate this, but um, what is it do you think has built that family dynamic that a lot of other restaurants and entrepreneurs don't have? Most restaurants have a very high turnover. Um, what is it that you do differently to, to keep your, your team happy, like a family? Okay, let's put it this way. I'm very lucky and yeah. I'm very blessed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, probably I could tell you that, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think that most of the people that work with us, uh, I really don't see them as employees. Um, I don't know, you know what, it's, I, 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 I can explain it to you. Okay? I think the employees will know better to explain it better than me. Yeah. Why do they stay? Yeah. But I think to a certain degree, it's, it's about the type of person you are and they respect the type of person you are that you come at them like an equal because I've been with you behind the scenes in the kitchen and it's like a family, you know, it's like their, their uncle or, you know, it's not like their boss that they're scared of. It's like their family. So do you think a lot of it had to do with how you treat them that keeps them coming back as well? I think a lot has to do with your personality. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that uh, in, see, we all think differently, okay? Right. I always see the best of every people that work with us. I don't see if they're bad, and if they're bad, I don't want to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, you know, yeah. I always, I, everybody has their... Sure, good and bad. Yes, and I think it's, when you have a friend working with you, and I think you become friends, and you treat him right. And it's not so much like we treat him right because you treat him right because, because they deserve to be treated right. Right. Because look at this restaurant, it's very successful. All the restaurants are very successful and we don't have a turnover of employees, they stay. Yeah. So. Um, wow, that's amazing. Now, what year did you guys start Javier's? 95, April 10, 95. 95. Take me back to the first day you opened. So you got fired. Uh, you and Mark schemed that you guys are going to start this restaurant. Um, oh, actually, first, before you tell me that, tell me why you ended up naming it Javier's. First of all, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> of course. Okay. Uh, so 
but let, let me go a little back. The first time uh-huh. that I went to talk to the people uh, at Tortilla Flats uh-huh. and of uh, Javier's and yeah. Laguna, the owners of Javier's, well, it, was, it wasn't Javier's in those days, whatever the name of the restaurant was. So you guys Mr. Bought a and Mrs. Fung. Yeah. They were the owners of the property. I went in, went in by myself. Yeah. And when I went in, they knew who I was. Yeah. And they asked me to get out of it. I don't want to say the words they meant, told me in camera wow. because they're not too, too nice. Yeah, yeah. So they t- actually kicked me out. Get out. Get out. And this is the Mexican restaurant that you guys were going to purchase to make your first location? Yes. Wow. So that day I turned around and I went home and I went home very upset and I told my wife, this is what happened. Yeah. So I waited it another six or eight months yeah. and I saw it was a beautiful location. Yeah. That it was still empty. Yeah. Wow. So I went back again. Yeah. And I, they told me the same thing. So I, went, and I said, so I finally said, you know what? Before I go, why don't you listen to my story? All the things that you're saying, it is not true. Yeah. Okay. I don't steal, I don't do drugs. So I said, if I would have been stealing, I don't even have a car. I have to get a bus to come here to your property, I said. Yeah. So they start talking to me. Yeah. I said, I want to open a restaurant. They show me the place. They walk me to the location. Yeah. They said, okay. But they wanted to be my partners. Mm. And I said to them that I already had a partner. Mark Post. Take my Mark Post. We start making all the negotiations. When I thought that everything was getting ready to sign, I still remember that I was in court. So when I got out of court, I called Mark. We didn't have phones in those days. Yeah. And I said, what happened? How's going on? I said, well, I just want to let you know that we're not going to open the restaurant because the fund said it's not going to happen. I said, what? Say yes. I drew to Mr. Fong. I asked Mr. Fong what happened. Yeah. He said, I don't want to talk about it. He, he actually kicked me out again. So you drove, and this is a lesson for entrepreneurs out there. When you get a rejection, you still went anyways to confront it because you're, you're like going to will this to, to happen no matter what. Yeah, that was my dream. Yeah. He, they, they took away all the dreams that I had, uh, yeah. that I built yeah. before we opened. So you were so, fighting for your dream. Holy shit. And they had this stigma against you because of the reputation of why they think you got fired or whatever it was. No, in, in those days, I don't think that was the reason. I think they had somebody else who wanted to go in the property. Uh, probably, I don't, I don't know, but I think that's what it was. So you drove over to him to talk to him and said, what, what's up about the deal? <laughs> and, they, and they said to get out. Wow. I didn't have a phone. I was working in those tacos. Yeah. So I give him the number of those tacos. <laughs> Say, call me. I said, don't worry, I'm not going to call you. I said, well, you never know. Yeah. Three months, four later, three or four months, they stopped by. Those tacos. So you to, were working to at eat. A, ah, to eat. So you were working at another Mexican restaurant at this it time. It was a little fast food operation. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That was another experience that we had. Yeah. With all the, all the guys that work here, the ladies who create all the plates that were working in those tacos. So yeah. they, we had great food in that little place. Yeah, wow. So the fonts stop in to eat? After like the fourth time, yeah. they asked me if I was still interested in coming back. Yeah. And I said, yes. <laughs> wow. So we had a meeting, uh-huh. but again, they wanted to be my partners. They didn't want Mark Post to be my partner. Mm-hmm. I convinced them, we signed papers. Yeah. And I was the happiest man in the world. Yes. It's like when you let your little dog run and you go crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was feeling the same way. Yeah. I remember getting out of the building, yeah. driving to my house. Yeah. I was living with my brother in my, a bedroom yeah. apartment. And one of his bedrooms that he rented to me. Yeah, with your wife, right? Yeah. Wow. And, um, and my kids. So you had your wife and kids in your 40s living in a one-bedroom apartment? Yep. Were you sleeping on a mattress or you guys all had beds? We or? were in bed, but they sleep on the floor. <laughs> wow. And of course, this is messing with your ego as a man, right? Wanting to be a provider. How could this happen, right? Like you have that, that those sort of thoughts kind of hurting you a little bit too, right? I don't know too much in my ego. Yeah. It was just hard to see my kids, okay? Um, but I mean... Um, 
I remember that I got to the apartment and I called my mom and I let him know, you know what, you don't have to worry. Yeah. And uh, that was probably one of the happiest days of my life. So what's the first thing you do when you walk into the restaurant and it's officially yours? Start cleaning it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the beginning we did construction. We started doing construction. You know, we remodeled it. Yeah. And when we were getting ready to open, because we cannot use that kitchen there, we were doing all the cooking in my house. By that time, I already had bought, when I knew that we signed the papers and I was start working on those tacos, I asked a friend, let's buy an apartment and I didn't have any money, yeah. but I had good credit. Yeah. So I bought it with my credit card. Yeah. I remember that I put it in my master charge. Yeah. And we bought an apartment. It was a three bedroom apartment in uh, yeah. uh, Rancho Santa Margarita. Did you always take risks like this? I mean, it seems like you were buying cars, houses, I mean, all sorts of stuff with no money. I mean, did that, where did that come from? Were you always risk averse a little bit? And do you think it's important as an entrepreneur to have a little bit of that? Well, you have to risk but you have to be, be smart. I mean, you can't just take a risk without knowing the results, yeah. you know, so I- Calculated I, risk, yeah. Yeah, so I knew that uh, I was already working in those tacos and I knew I was already making money through the construction from the restaurant. Uh, so I knew we were gonna open the restaurant and I was gonna have a salary and and become an owner and be very happy. And yeah. I knew it was going to be okay. You knew you were going to be successful in the restaurant. You, you don't think that way. You leave a little room yeah. all the time. You have to be nervous. Yeah. You have to be stressed. To keep you on your toes. Oh, yes. If you're not stressed, you forget things. Yeah, you get comfortable. You get yes. too comfortable. And, um, but the main thing of all this thing it was we were so happy. Me, my wife, my kids, my friends. Yeah. All of us, it was like <laughs> so happy yeah. that we were going to have a restaurant and we were going to be together. Yeah. And how did the name for Javier's come about? That was my partner, Mark. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> he, um, he wanted to name it Javier. I said, no, we want to name it a different name. That's so said, funny. Usually it would be the opposite. Usually the person would want to name it after themselves. I thought naming it Javier was a little too... I don't know, too selfish, too. I, I yeah. didn't want to name it Javier. But it, I said, it, but it didn't sound good at all for me. The yeah. name of the Mexican restaurant called Javier's. Yeah. I didn't like the name. Which is so funny, because now it's like iconic for Mexican food. See, yeah. I don't see it as my name. I see it now like a brand. Yeah. Uh, so he said, look, Javier, people know you in Laguna Beach. Yeah. A lot of the people know you in Laguna Beach. And yeah. we're going to put a sign, this neo sign, beautiful, that we're going to put, <laughs> it's going to say Javier. Yeah. And people are going to come because they know you in the Yeah. And it's also a good F you to Tortilla Flats. Because <laughs> it's, it's a good F you to Tortilla Flats because <laughs> it's your name on the, on the building. Yes. Yes. So you guys open in Laguna? Yes. <laughs> Talk to me about the first day. What happens the first day of business? I, the, the only thing I remember the first day, the most of everything I remember, yeah. first of all, we were very happy. Yeah. And we were crazy. Yeah. So we invited a lot of people, yeah. and uh, it, it, it was exciting. It, yeah. And you know one thing that I noticed right away, yeah. that the vibe that we had in the restaurant yeah. was so beautiful. Yeah. Everybody was happy. So I remember that uh, more than anything, you know, and, and talking to all the people that we knew, and yeah. it, was, it, was, it was great. And that's the way we started, and we went like that through the whole time. Working and, and the first year in business was smooth, good, not too many hiccups? <sighs> when you mean hiccups and... Um, and in, getting customers and things no, like no, that? No, no, you know what, since, since we opened the restaurant, Omar, I, I said, let's say we can do a million and a half in a year. That was, that was the goal. To do a million and a half in one year? A million and a half, in, in, uh, okay, that was the goal. Yeah. I said, we did $2 million at Tortilla Flat the last year that I was there. <laughs> This is very small, but let's see if we can do a million and a half. And I knew I wasn't going to have Taco Tuesday. Yeah. That I knew since the beginning. Yeah. No Taco Tuesday here. So <laughs> since we opened, yeah. we start getting busy, busy, busy. Well, the first year, the, we didn't have a whole year. We passed the two million. Wow. And the time that we were there, when we left, we were already at seven and a half million dollars in that little place. Hell yeah. I love it. And how long? 
Uh, that one, we stayed there for 12 years, 13 yeah. years. Wow, and got it to seven and a half million in revenue. If I remember that place was 3,800 yeah. square feet. Yeah. It was small. Yeah, holy cow. So at that point, you're like, oh man, like I'm pretty good at this restaurant thing. Well, I didn't think that way. Yeah. <laughs> then we opened the Irvine store. Do you, do, you remember, do you remember the first time where you saw the money, like money got to a certain point where you said, holy shit, this is a lot bigger than I thought. Do you remember the first time that happened? Where you saw a check or you, the profits and went, oh my God, this is bigger than I even imagined. Well, I never thought that we're gonna be so successful in Laguna Beach. Yeah. The only person who said that we're gonna be making a lot more money than yeah. that yeah. was Eloy. Was who? Eloy. Eloy said to me, yeah. Who's this that? is Eloy is a gentleman who worked with us. Okay. That's the gentleman who was older than me. Ah, yes. Who got fired when I was fired. Yeah. Uh, he said, you wait, you're going to be making more money. Yeah. You yourselves are going to be growing. Yeah. And um, so when they kick us out of there, the punks yeah. again, and we needed to get another restaurant, and we came here. Yeah. I was nervous. Yeah. I was like really nervous. Yeah. I used to come through the construction, and I used to see this restaurant, and this center was empty. Mm -hmm. And I said, we're not gonna have any lunches. Yeah. Sundays, no one's gonna be here. Yeah. And I'm already thinking, how are we gonna pay the rent? Yeah. <laughs> how are we gonna pay the loan for the restaurant? Yeah. It's okay, you never had money anyways when you, <laughs> so, when you get places, yeah. I told my wife, you know what, I don't know, this. but you know what, we opened this restaurant, no advertising, we opened the doors, crazy, crazy busy. Really? Yes. And was your wife a cheerleader for you at that time? Has your wife always been, because I know you've told me that uh, like a lot of times you attribute a lot of your success to her support She's and her love. She's still part of me. Yeah. So was there a lot of tough times where you were uncertain about what to do or went to her for advice and she would kind of egg you on, be your cheerleader a little bit? Was there a little bit of that going on as well? Well, she always been very supportive. Yeah. And one of the things that I like about her, you know, that, that we don't argue and things about the restaurant and things about the house. Yeah. Uh, she always tell me, you know, whatever you want to do is fine with me. Yeah. Uh, it is. That's the way she is. You and that's know? the way you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I do, but sometimes I like her to be more... Um, Challenging with you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but I mean, uh, it's like a chance. She's, yeah. But she's part of the success. Yeah. Big part of the success. She worked at Tortilla Flats. She worked with us through the whole Laguna Beach tour. Everybody knew my wife. Uh, the employees remember her very good because she was very picky when they were cleaning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, and then he came in and stayed here for about a couple of years when we opened. Yeah. So how long after your first location do you guys open up your second? I think it was about five years. Five years. And then now you guys are at six locations, correct? Yes. Where are all your locations for people who are watching and may want to visit after watching this interview? Uh, we have one in La Jolla. That's the newest. La Jolla, California. We have one in uh, Los Angeles and uh, Santa Monica Boulevard, Century City, California. Uh, we have the one in Irvine, California. We have the one in Las Vegas, in Aria Hotel. We have the one in Cabo, Los Cabos. And, uh, and we have this one. Yeah, I love it, very cool. Now talk to me a little bit about, for entrepreneurs out there, what have you learned uh, is important when it comes to scaling, right? Because it's one thing to have success in one location, but as you know, you, you mentioned, you have 800 employees now, uh, you have six locations, there's a lot of moving parts. I know you have managers in place to manage it all, but for entrepreneurs who are watching this and maybe have a business and want to start scaling, maybe opening a second location or a third, what are some important things you've learned when it comes to scaling uh, a restaurant that are important to be on top of? I think when you open a restaurant and start getting in the high levels, more scale, one of the things that you have to think in the beginning, forget about how much money you're going to make in profits. That will come if you make the things right. You have to, put, make, you have to spend money to make money. I believe, you see, I believe in having enough management. I believe in having a, a, enough employees. I don't believe in cutting in employees. 
I believe in having the best quality food in everything that you do. Yeah. I believe that your place have to be very clean. But again, I'm talking about the restaurant business. I can't talk about another business. Right, yeah. You have to have your vision that you want. You have to make sure the employees understand what you want. But you have to show your employees that you're right. Yeah. Not by saying things, yeah. by talking to them, it's from seeing the way you do things. Yeah. They just follow you. Lead by example. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And how are you able to replicate it at different restaurants? Is it, again, same thing, just leading by example? And how do you know who to hire? How do you know who are the right people? I think one time you told me something brilliant. Um, again, when we were on your jet, we had lovely conversations. But I remember you told me one time that, um, that people have to sort of earn their way up. You don't just hire outside managers from other restaurants a lot of the time, right? Most people have worked their way up. They've, they've gone from like, every level, so they understand the level below it. Is that, is that correct? Well. In our case here, yeah. and like I said, we all have different mentalities and right. think differently, okay? We have so many employees, okay? They have become, all the guys who are in charge of the restaurant became, started like this watcher, Pepe, Tony, I'm this. A Moises, nice. um, Ga Gabby, mm -hmm. myself. We all of us start from the bottom Called me, his brother, his cousin, they're all were these watchers. And now those guys are the people, that they, they are the heart and the brain of the restaurant. I don't think, and not because people are not capable of working with us, right. coming from another restaurant, because they are, but people who've been with us from the bottom understand the culture that we have, the way we work. And it's a lot easier. Yeah. So, see, I don't mind if some of the employees and some of the managers don't speak English. <laughs> but I, I, what I really care is how the way they work mm -hmm. and their ethic. That's what I care. Yeah. So talk to me about uh, some of the challenges uh, that come with being an entrepreneur of a successful organization. I mean, we've had on dozens of entrepreneurs. And like you mentioned earlier, if you're not on pins and needles, if you get too comfortable, Sometimes uh, things in your business can falter. So talk to me a little bit about some of the important things for any entrepreneur uh, that are important to always make sure to be on top of. Uh, obviously the numbers are important, but like maybe some other things, maybe one or two tidbits about like how, what do you look for when hiring the right people or uh, maybe margins in your products. Uh, just anything like that. What are some things you think are very, very important uh, for entrepreneurs to have long-term success to focus on? Well, I think the number one, and going to having a restaurant, number one has to be your food. Yeah. That's number one. Yeah. And I think we don't cut any corners. I think we, in, any, any, anything that we do, we try to buy the best quality. Even if it ends up meaning that the food costs more on the menu? I don't talk about food costs. We don't talk about labor costs. Yeah. Uh, because, like I mentioned before, we, we still make very good money, okay? Right. Why do I going to worry about my food cost and my lever cost? Now, in the beginning, you probably can worry. Yeah. But in these days, the only thing that I worry, I want to make sure that when people walk out of here, they walk out with the experience. Yeah. Not we ate at Javier's. We went, our service, our food, everything was great. They had a great vibe. Araceli was excellent. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to come back because I want to see her. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I want to hear. I like when all the people that work with us become friends with the employees because you created a vibe and that's what we try to do in all the restaurants. Yeah. I think that if you go to this kitchen or any of the kitchens that we have and we're really busy, you're not going to see those guys stressed. Yeah. They're always happy. Yeah, joking around, <laughs> laughing. They're happy yeah. and it doesn't matter how busy it is, but you have to see it for yourself, yeah. okay? And uh, you ask me, when we open restaurants, I have uh, my kid Omar and my daughter Sylvia and Javier and of course Pepe. They do most of the hiring and Omar has become very good when he does the hiring. So that makes a big difference, yeah. okay? Uh, when it comes to management, we don't really hire managers. But we do hire everybody else. We hire cooks, 
waiters, busboys, bartenders. Yeah. But we take all the employees that work with us to train them, or we bring them to the restaurant to be trained. So what, what, are, what are qualities you look for when hiring people or that Omar looks for when hiring people? Because it's very important. I mean, that becomes your army. That becomes how you scale. That becomes your, your front end um, connection between you and your customers. So it's very, very important to be hiring the right people. So what are things that you have found over the years are very important to look for when hiring somebody? I think when you hire most of the people, you let them do all the talking. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's better if you just ask them a few things and let them talk. Mm -hmm. Let them say what they, that's the way I like to do it. Um, look, we have some of the employees here that if, if I want to interview them, like Celestino, Constantino, yeah. they don't talk. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hire them, yeah. but they got so much talent. Yeah. So you know what? It's difficult. Yeah. It's difficult. Yeah. It's difficult. Makes sense. Okay, now what are some things that have been the most challenging over the years when it comes to building a business? Maybe things that you still struggle with and how do you get past it? Just because there might be entrepreneurs watching this and they might go, oh, well, Javier has it so easy, it's so successful. But of course, there's always so many moving parts. What are things currently that are a challenge that you're learning right now how to get past? Maybe current struggles that you're overcoming. You're going to think that I'm crazy, okay? But you know, in reality, we don't ever have been in those struggles. Uh, the biggest struggles that you get in our situation is most of the time is, most of the time is with people who try to sue you because you become successful. Mm, gotcha. Uh -huh. um, those are the most, for me, are yeah. the most difficult things to handle because you have no control with those things. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes of, of uh, our business, it's like I say, I've been very blessed, Omar. I've been very blessed because all the restaurants, they do very well. Uh, all the people that work with us, they stay with us. Yeah. They're happy. Uh, so I can't really complain yeah. about this. I can say that I have struggles in the restaurant. Yeah. And what I do, it doesn't feel like work. It's just feel like it's something that somebody give to me. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's make things very easy. Like you're getting paid to play. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm getting paid. I love it. <laughs> to having these restaurants. Yeah, paid to play. Paid and to I, make and, people happy. And I think my kids feel the same way. And I think a lot of the people that work with us, like Pepe and Tony, and all the guys, too many people, you know, it's just, that's the way I, I think they feel. What do you think makes, like, what do you think most restaurants don't do successfully? And what do you think makes a successful restaurant overall? Like if Javier had a secret formula, what is it that it takes, aside from good people? Because you guys do a phenomenal job at ambiance. Obviously, the food is always phenomenal. But what is your, if you had to give a 60-second piece of advice, what's your recipe for having a successful restaurant to last? Well, you have to keep consistency. You yes can say, you know, I'm going to go and open a restaurant and I'm, I'm going to become successful and I, we made it. I think differently. We want to get better every time. In, every day we want to get better. Uh, and it's a nonstop. For somebody to say, well, Javier doesn't have to go to work anymore. That is not true. <laughs> you work every day. But like for me, it doesn't feel like work. I love what I'm doing, don't get me wrong. If I have to come in the morning, like six in the morning yeah. here to meet with the landscaping people, I love it. Yeah. I, I, it's something that I'm not gonna complain. It have, it's, for me, what I do is what I like. Yeah. How, and, how important is that to your success, do you think? I, well, I don't think if you like something, you can become su successful, you know. And anything that you're gonna do, you really have to like it. And this is the thing for anybody who wants to open a restaurant and become successful. N number one, I always have said, you know what? First thing, you have to be serious. You have to f have a vision to do something. You can't complain. And if you're Latin, don't tell me that you are coming to a country and you've been discriminated because that's not an excuse. Yeah. Stop having excuses. When you start having excuses, 
and go to work and become serious. And another thing, you know, I think you have to listen. You have to learn how to listen. If you don't listen, you're not going to be successful. And you learn from all the people that work with you. You learn from the dishwashers. You learn from the cleanup men. You look from everybody because you know what? They're very smart people. Not because they're in that position, that means that they're not smart. They're very smart people. Yeah. And you've done all those roles, so you know what it's like at every level. Yeah. How about when it comes to the tactical, and that was beautiful advice, by the way. How about when it comes to the tactical inside of a restaurant? Uh, for example, like uh, maybe when it comes to a bar or the food or the colors, any tactical advice you'd give to uh, restaurateurs? Don't worry, they, they probably can't compete with you anyways. But any advice you would give to people like that? Or do you think it's just a matter of um, having quality stuff and all that other interior design and stuff like that doesn't matter as much as having quality customer service and food? Well, I think, I think in the restaurant business, everything's matter. Everything counts. Uh, it's like I said, I can't pinpoint one thing because there are too many things. Yeah. It's all the way from the time you're walking through the front or through the back door, or when you close the restaurant, or when you open the restaurant. Everything is, is so many different things. When you're in the restaurant business and the only thing you know how to do is restaurants and you work every position, yeah. it becomes very easy. Yeah, very but intuitive. But you have to like it, you know? You have to like people too. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. And I think that speaks to what you're saying about like having to have passion for what you do. Because when you're passionate about what you do, you're willing to put in the late hours, the early nights, the details. And it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like it drains you. It feels like it energizes you. It feels like it excites you. Uh, would you agree with that? That the passion is what gives you unlimited energy to do everything that you wouldn't logically do because you're so emotional about it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Makes sense. Okay. Now, what about this? Um, what would you have done differently uh, building Javier's from, obviously you started in your mid 40s, mid to late 40s to now. Uh, what would you have done differently? Anything you would have done differently? <laughs> if I had the chance to do it again, I would do, I would do it the same thing. Really? <laughs> yeah. Same exact way. I yeah. mean, but I want the same people working with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, want all the, I want the same people that work with me. I want my same kids. Yeah helping me. Yeah. I want my wife helping me. I want to have my partner, Mark. Yeah. I want all the same people that we have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm fine. I, I will not do anything differently. Yeah. Well, you've, you've had major success. And, and not only that, like I know a lot of celebrities and different famous entrepreneurs have even reached out to you and come to your restaurants all the time, right? Yes. Who are some people or some notable people? I know, I know when we flew out of the airport, I think Kobe Bryant had walked in and he said, hey, what's up, Javier? Yes. Kobe Bryant comes. Who are some other people that have been uh, guests at your restaurant before? Too many. I don't remember a lot of the names. I know more the names of the athletes, but the people that are in the movies, yeah. or the rappers, yeah. or I really don't know the names, but LA get a lot of movie, uh, people that are in the movie business. Yeah. Here, Las Vegas, we get a lot of people, uh, boxers. Yeah. We get a lot of celebrities. Yeah. Have you ever had, uh, I know you're telling me about uh, Steve Wynn, right? Yes. What, what was that experience like? I think he had dined at your Las Vegas location or he reached out to you or talk to us about that. When we opened uh, the uh, restaurant and uh, we were getting ready to sign all the papers and Aria, he reached to me uh -huh. and he said he wanted to have a meeting with me. And I Steve thought, Wynn. Steve Wynn. The billionaire, and I, wow. I thought that my son was joking. He said, Pop, Steve Wynn is looking for you. Yeah. He wants you to call him. I said, somebody's playing a joke on you. <laughs> no, he said, it's Steve Wynn. The billionaire, Steve yes. Wynn. So I did call him. We had a conversation. Yeah. He invited me to go to his uh, locations to be his guest. And he said, you don't belong in the, at the area. You belong at the Wynn. Yeah. But I said, I feel honored, but you know, I can't open a restaurant at the Wynn anymore. I have to open it in, in, yeah. in area. I said, I already talked to Bobby and Billy. I said, I remember that he said, don't worry about those boys. Those boys work for me. <laughs> but I said, now they're the president and vice president at NGM, I said. Yeah. And another occasion after we opened LA, I got a phone call from his GM, yeah. uh, Maurice. Yeah. And he said, uh, in half an hour, Mr. Wynn's gonna call you. I wanna make sure that you answer. Yeah. So I said, of course I'll answer him. Yeah. 
he did call me. Uh, he was very nice. Yeah. And I think he has a very distinguished voice, the way yeah, he talks. Yeah, very powerful voice, yes. yeah. Friendly and powerful, yeah. He t said to me that um, um, he, he thanked me for the service and the food in Aria, yeah. and the service and the food in uh, the store in LA, yeah. Javier's and in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And then he asked me if I had a few minutes for him. Yeah. And I said, of course I have a few minutes for him. <laughs> He asked me, are you busy? I said, I'm not busy for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So wow. I have to say the thing that he said to me is probably been my highlight of my life and the business yeah. when I talk to business people. Yeah. Um, he um, says to me, um, when he said, do you have a few minutes? I said, yes. I said, um, I, I'm going to tell you something that I have never said to anybody yeah. in this business because this is what I do for a living. I do hotels, I do nightclubs, I've been all over the world, I have eaten every place in the world. Yeah. I have my own places. And I said, I know, you, I know you're Mr. Las Vegas, I know who <laughs> you are, I said, yeah. I, I know. And I, he said, but I have to mention something to you. And I'm not the kind of person to talk to many people, yeah. but I have to say something to you, Javier. He said, um, when I went to your locations, yeah. I noticed that the people that work at your restaurants, starting from the hostess, cocktail waitress, waiter, bartender, busboy, managers, they represent your brand in a way that I've never seen anybody in any place being represented. He said, uh, and I don't tell this thing to many people, yeah. but he said, the reason why you're very successful, he said, is something that you did not went to school to learn. And I can get all my employees and send them to school and people can go to school to try to learn what you have done and they're not gonna learn. Yeah. He said, the reason why you are so successful is because you transmit your brand to your employees. And they, represent your brand better than anybody else. They feel the same way you do. And I just want to let you know that that's something that you cannot teach. Holy cow. So he had dined at the restaurant and had this amazing experience. What did that feel like for you? Uh, young, to think that you came from Mexico, not having much, went through a journey as a dishwasher to now having Mr. Las Vegas, the billionaire himself, call you and tell you that. What does that feel like for you? How do you think I feel? <laughs> surreal. It must yeah. feel surreal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But you know what made me very happy too? When my little girl, my granddaughter, said to this lady one day, she was talking to me, talking to me in my ear, said, Papayito. I said, no, stop, Gabriela. Don't talk to me in secret. Yeah. Tell the lady what you want to say. So she turned around and tells this lady, he's my papayito. <laughs> That's so cute. And he's very famous. Yeah. He told him, my mom, look at her. <laughs> she was about eight years old. Yeah. He's very famous. And he embedded in Taco Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. like, oh my God, I couldn't believe what she was saying. Yeah. And they, I seen some movies when they mentioned Taco Tuesday, she yeah. said. That made me like the happiest man in the world. Oh man, <laughs> that's incredible, I love it. So let me ask you this before we wrap up the interview. What would the young Javier, who had a dream to you know, make his vision a reality, he didn't exactly know how, uh, you know, I know you wanted to be successful, you like nice things, but you didn't know how to do it. What would the Javier today say to that young Javier who was looking for answers uh, on how to make his, his dream happen and didn't know what to do? What would this Javier say to that young Javier who was looking for answers? If, if, if you have a dream, okay, and you believe in the dream that you have, and you have that vision, yes, do it. Yes, do it. I mean, uh, don't let anything stop you. I mean, when I say don't let anything stop you is you're probably going to have some 
people who gonna advise you in different ways. And it's very difficult to get advice in a, in a situation like this. He has to have his own feeling of what he wants to do. But again, Omar, he has to be serious and he has to know that he has to work hard. You just can't have a dream. And because you have a dream and you say that you want to do something in life, it's going to become reality because that's not going to happen. You have to work. It's powerful. You have to work. What about people who say, well, I, I know I, I want to do big things, but I don't know what my dream is. I like this and I like that, but I don't know how to find it. Do you think it's important to go try things, go get your hands dirty by experimenting, and then when you do that, you'll find your thing? Or what advice would you give people who, have, who are willing to work, willing to do the action, but don't know where to channel the energy into? They don't have that clear dream. What advice would you give people like that? I think we all have get to, to an age that we really know what we like. If you really don't know what you like, I can give him advice. Yeah. You have to have something that you like. Doesn't matter yeah. if it's not restaurant business. Yeah. It can be anything that you like. And you, become, you can become very successful. There are so many people, they're so successful. I mean, and they been become successful for ideas they have, but they work hard, they believe in it, and they become successful. I can name many people, uh, many brands who have become very successful, but nothing comes because somebody's going to give it to you. You just, in life, you have to earn, you have to work, have respect, listen. That's the only advice I can give them, you know. I love that. It's very powerful, man. Okay, so before we wrap up this interview, I want to ask you one more question, and then we have a little game. So uh, my question is, um, as you look back on everything you've built with Javier's, and um, you know, you've obviously done a tremendous job, and you obviously I know you have a lot of ambition in opening up new stores, looking for new locations, you're always thinking about growing. Um, what is the future of Javier's? What do you hope to be your legacy? What do you hope, you know, when life is, is over and done with, what would, you, what would be the best case scenario for what your story uh, would be about to somebody who's you know, watching this or seeing what you've done? What do you hope people learn by your life as an example with the business? Uh, my dream come true. My, um, how do you say it? Yeah. And the cake, how do you say it? The, uh, yeah, having your, uh, eat it, having your cake and eating it too. Okay, it yeah. would be is um, when after being successful, being able to my families, and when I talk about my family, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, enjoy everything that we have done. Okay, I want them to be happy. That will be my. That would make me very happy. That's beautiful. I love that. And then before we wrap up, we have a game. So the game is called First Things First. So the way the game works is I'm just going to say a quick word or phrase. I'm going to say 10 of them, a quick word or phrase. And then you just tell me the first word or phrase that comes to mind, like a relation game. Make sense? OK. OK. You want to explain how to say it? I understand. Okay, I, I understand. Okay. So you just tell me the first word or phrase or sentence that comes to mind. And what I, I know if I don't have it? But you, you have to say something. The only rule is that you can't repeat yourself twice. Okay. Okay? So the first word, um, tortilla flats. Great experience. Great learning. Your wife. The best. At, at the best. Success. Working hard. Uh, money. You need it, but health, being healthy is more important than money. Becoming a millionaire, a multimillionaire. It's a dream come true for everybody, but you just be happy with what you have. Um, what you think your mom would say if she could see your success today? She's seen me already. <laughs> She's, She's seen it? She's a star. Yeah. Uh, the tough times or failure? Uh, I think in life it's good for you to have a tough time in life. It uh, give you, uh, it makes you humble, it makes you realize many things. 
The worst piece of advice you've ever been given? The worst advice that I've been given, can I say two? Yeah, say them both. One is when I was fired from Tortilla Flats, <laughs> they mentioned, forget about it. Let's go back to Tijuana, stay in Tijuana. You're not going to be able to do any, anything and just go back to Tijuana. And I said, no, I'm, that's my beginning. I said, no, I'm not going back. The other one is when somebody told me when I was fired, get out your credit cards, fill them up, <laughs> and go back reps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about the best piece of advice uh, you've ever received and that you give others? I think the best advice that I have received is what my parents teach me is when you wake up in the morning, and you're healthy, you're the richest man in the world. Being healthy makes you very happy, and you can be happy. Being rich, that's not, not gonna make you happy. Yeah, very true. And really quick, before I give you the last word, I know that you've always seemed fit. Is, is a gym a part of your regular routine, and has that always been a part of your routine throughout the years? Has that been important to you? Mm, that's part of my life, yes. Really? Yes. How, how important do you think fitness has been to your success in business? Very, it's, it's a big part of it. It's, it's a big part of it. I think uh, when you work out, um, your energy levels are so much better. Your um, mind is so much clear. Uh, Emotions, too. I mean, you, it's, it's great. I mean, going to the gym and working out, but I... But when I mean working out, you know what? You can't go to the gym and just go and socialize. Yeah. yeah. You really, no in reality, <laughs> yeah. you have to go and work hard. You know, I like to go and I like to do um, high intensity exercise. And how old are you at this age, if you don't mind sharing? No, because I don't want everybody to know, but I'm okay. just kidding you. <laughs> I'm 70 years old, wow. but I feel like in my 18, 19 years old. Yeah. That's the way I feel. Wow. 70, still going to the gym, beautiful, thriving business. Uh, incredible. Okay, now the last word, you ready? Passion. That's what makes you. You have to have it. If you don't have it, if you don't have passion and you don't have discipline, it's very difficult to become successful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your success story on the show today, Javier. It's been a privilege. My pleasure, Thank Omar. you guys for tuning in. Make sure to check out more of Javier's stuff and check out any of the locations in the description below. And until next time, thank you for being one of the passionate few. If you guys enjoyed that video, be sure to hit that subscribe button right now because every week we bring you the very best in personal development content, interviews, and insight to help inspire you to take your life and your dreams and make them a reality. And also, if you want to know how to book dream guests the same way I have, you can check the link below for my top three secrets. So if you have a podcast or a show or whatever it is and you want to collaborate with them, if you click that link below, I'll give you those top three secrets to help you get in touch with anybody. And also, don't forget that The Passionate View is available on media platforms as well. So you can subscribe to the podcast. And until next time, thank you for being one of The Passionate Few.